Hey church, welcome to episode five of our series in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament entitled Under the Sun. And the sermon title for today is The Quest for More. You know, something that happened recently that I've been tracking is a development in the lives of my friends. They decided around a year ago to sell everything they owned. They have two children, and they thought to themselves, we want to change everything in our life. So they sold their home, they got rid of their mortgage, they sold their cars, they sold almost all of their possessions, and when they were in the process of selling all of these things, they bought an RV. Now, when they purchased this RV, they took some time to renovate it, and they're designers and professional photographers, so they did it right. They renovated this entire home on the move and they made it into this beautiful, stunning RV. In fact, some of the pictures that I've been tracking as they started out on this journey on their Instagram page, I saw that in their little living room, there's a fireplace. Not like an actual wood fireplace, but a gas fireplace. And it's absolutely stunning, real wood floors and updated appliances. They decided to do this because they said they didn't want to run this rat race anymore. They didn't want to be consumed with all of the bills and all of the things to maintain. They just wanted to take their family, homeschool their kids, get in the RV, drive around the country, and enjoy one another, to see friends they haven't seen in years, to drive to the best weather and when whatever month they find themselves in and live simply. And as I've been following their story and seeing the pictures of where they're going and what they're doing, I can't help but have a, a sense of envy, of, of just desire to experience a little bit of that. There's so much freedom that they are experiencing without all of the bills to pay and the mortgage to maintain and the car leases and all of the other things that we all struggle with and we feel the need to continue to not only pay but to get more so we can accumulate more so we can grow. And I've been reading some of the comments too and, and it seems so many people are jealous of their life. Now I know it's not all perfect and I know that there's a lot of difficulties but there is something desirous about that kind of life that is free, that feels removed from a culture that tells you and tells me that we constantly need more. We need more money. We need more material possessions. We need more luxuries to enjoy life. And here in chapter 5, where we find ourselves, the Koheleth, the, the leader of this book, the preacher, he is going to speak to us about another quest that he went down in his life. He's spoken about several already, the quest for accomplishment and for meaning and for happiness or satisfaction. Last week was the quest for answers around the topic of justice. And so tonight he's going to say that I went on a quest for more. And in particular, a quest for more money, more material possessions. He's going to walk us through the journey of his life and what he found for himself, but also what he saw in other people. Because as he paints this picture, this is not just something that he alone struggled with or felt, but that he sees in the lives of so many. And I dare to say that you feel that too, that you resonate with that temptation for more money for more or better material possessions. 
regardless of where your financial position may be right now or where the opportunities are before you, there is something within us and the culture that we live in feeds it too where we want more. I gave an illustration uh, a couple weeks ago and I think it applies here too. If you begin to think, well, I don't know if I'm really on a quest for more money. I feel pretty content. I'm not really striving for all of these things. I'm, I'm perfectly happy. And you feel as if that is not a temptation for you. If you're in that place, great. You may be thinking, I'm actually thinking about buying an RV and living that simple life now. But what if I were to tell you that there's an opportunity tomorrow that you can step into that will require some sacrifices, but you're prepared for it, qualified. There's an opportunity awaiting you tomorrow where you could double your income. Things would change in your life, but you're gonna double your income. Would you take that opportunity? You may say, I don't know, I kind of like my life, but would you at least be tempted by it? I think almost all of us would say, yeah, I'd I'd be tempted by it. Because there's something that stirs within us to find more, to accumulate more, more money, more possessions. And so we go on this quest today with the Kohelet, starting in verse 10, where he says this as he begins this journey. He says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So he starts out with kind of this just blanket statement that if you love money, you're never going to be satisfied with money. And if you're consumed with your wealth and what you can accumulate, it's never going to satisfy you. He reiterates here one of the main thrusts of the entire book, and that is whatever quest you find yourself on, a quest for accomplishment, a quest for meaning, a quest for more money, you are going to arrive at the conclusion that it is hevel, the Hebrew word for vapor, or as it's translated here, vanity, that it's fleeting, that it's temporary. And here what he says is on this quest for more money, for more material possessions, for more wealth, that the cravings that you're trying to satisfy by accumulating more will never be satisfied. In fact, what you will find is something like indigestion. You will be eating and consuming and trying to get more and more. You will never be full and there will be a discomfort within you. You know, Jesus speaks about wealth often. And he speaks about the dangers and the temptations of money. One of the famous passages, Jesus speaks about God and money. And he says, you cannot serve two masters because you will love one and hate the other or you will serve one and disregard the other. The two masters is God and money or mammon. Because what you find is that if you begin to serve money, if you begin to go on a quest for more money that sits in the place of prominence in your heart and in your life, you will find yourself walking a path in the opposite direction of God because you cannot serve both God and money. The Apostle Paul warns too against the dangers of money. As he speaks to his disciple, Timothy, he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. He says, but those who desire to be rich, desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. See, he picks up on something that actually the preacher is going to, to speak about later in our passage this evening. And that is the person that has the desire, the person that embarks on the quest for more money, for more possessions, is going to find themselves in a snare, in a trap, and it's going to lead to destruction, to ruin. And so here at the very onset of the passage, which is supported by Jesus and by Paul, by other passages, is that when you go on a quest for more money, you will never find your cravings satisfied. You'll find, in fact, a discomfort within because it is likely that you may be walking in an opposite direction 
from God and the path that you should be following. Now, before we go any further, we have to check ourselves really quickly. Because sometimes when we hear passages like this, in particular around money, we begin to think about other people. Because nobody freely offers that they struggle with greed or that they're on a quest for more money. That is something that we kind of hide away or we justify in our mind or we keep away from other people. But the truth is, we're all struggling and tempted by the quest for more. But we think, okay, the, the, the cravings that are not being satisfied and the, the quest for more that people are on is people, it's not me. It's the gambler who has to have more money to gamble more money. I can see that person here. It's the business tycoon who has to keep you know, starting new ventures and opening up new businesses because it's gotta be more and more capital and more investments. Or it's the rich materialist who has to continue to make more money to support the lifestyle, to, to buy more possessions and to accumulate more luxuries. It's always somebody else, but the truth is, as Jesus warns, as the Apostle Paul speaks, and as the Koheleth, the preacher, is speaking about here, this temptation is within all of us. Temptation for more. More money, more wealth, more possessions. And it may not be as external as the gambler or as the rich materialist, but it can sometimes reside within and maybe not a lot of other people know it, but it feels in life, or maybe you feel yourself, a slight humming of discomfort. Like you tell people that you're satisfied and you're content and everything's good, but deep down you feel like you don't have what you need. You need more. You want more, surely, but you need more the temptation to fall into the difficulty and the dangers that money brings. And so let's make sure that we enter into the rest of this passage bringing ourselves, not thinking about other people, it's so tempting to do that, but to think about ourselves, the quest for more. So he goes from how the quest for more money or more possessions will never satisfy the cravings and longings of your soul to verse 11, where he says that the next layer is that it brings a complexity to your life when you embark upon this journey. Verse 11 says this, when goods increase, they increase who eats them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Now, what he's saying here is that with more money and with more things comes more complexity. Your life becomes a balancing act of a lot of things. There are more people that hang on to you, that swarm around you. This could be the employees that you depend upon you if you're running a company or an organization or a community of people. This could be family members. You know, one of the things that we read about time and time again is that lottery winners when they receive the fortune, all of a sudden, they have long lost family members that show up, that come around, talk about how much they've always loved them, and they've always been there, start hanging on, trying to take some of the fortune. As money increases, as you go on a quest for more, so does the complexity of life because people begin to hang on to you. Actually, the prophet Isaiah speaks about this too in Isaiah chapter 22. He speaks about the danger of being placed in a high position or being successful in regards to having people that depend upon you and having a position of wealth or status. He says this in verse 23 through 24 of Isaiah chapter 22. He says, I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place. And he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. And they will hang on him with the whole honor of his father's house. The offspring and issue, every small vessel 
from the cups to all the flagons, which I had to look up what those are. Those are like bottles for pouring wine. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way and it will be cut down and fall. Here's what he says. When you begin to embark upon a quest for more and you begin to accumulate more money and more wealth and more possessions, you are first fastened in a secure place. But as you are fastened in this secure place, there's all of these attachments that now start to pile on. There are people and and children and, and friends begin to hang on to you. In fact, he goes to even things within the kitchen, cups and bottles to pour wine. All of these things are hanging on you. And when you were once secure, receiving the honor and the prestige of your position, it will lead to you collapsing and falling in ruin. See, the prophet Isaiah is kind of bringing a little bit further what the Koheleth, the preacher here in Ecclesiastes 5 is saying, is that more money brings more complexity, but it also brings greater potential for burnout, for crash, for an implosion in your life. But there's another layer. It's not only that the quest for more money will not satisfy the desires and longings of your soul. It's not only that there's a complexity that comes to your life and a potential for a great crash. But thirdly, in verse 12, we read this. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. The third layer, the third aspect of going on a quest for more money is that it brings with it anxiety and worry and fear. That because you're pursuing more wealth and more money to fill your cravings, it only actually increases your cravings. And it then also increases the complexity within your life, which leads you to have sleepless nights because you have so much to maintain. You have so much to gather. You have a machine that you have to keep running and you have people that depend upon you and are hanging on to you and so you cannot even sleep. Anxiety and worry and fear. The juxtaposition here is with the laborer who sure has hardship in life and difficulty, but after a long day's work, and a productive day is able to have sleep that is sweet, where the owner, the one who is pursuing more and more and more, cannot sleep, is up restless and anxious. You see, the preacher here in in Ecclesiastes chapter five is not speaking from a removed position, as if he's just observing other people and and casting judgment. This is the life he lived. See, we believe that the writer of Ecclesiastes was Solomon, King Solomon, rich beyond measure. As he announces near the beginning of the book, he went on a quest to accumulate everything possible, as much money as he could. He was the Jeff Bezos of Israel had everything, and yet this is what he found. It brings complexity, it doesn't satisfy your cravings, it's vanity, fleeting, it's like a vapor. It brings about great worry and anxiety. And so he sums up his experience with a story about a man. Verse 13 through 17, he tells this story. He says this, there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil, that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness 
in much vexation and sickness and anger. He tells a story here of a man who went on a quest for more and he worked hard. He juggled the complexities of life. Surely he faced worry and anger or anxiety. More cravings began to develop within him, but everything that he had gained, he lost in an instant, in a bad venture. And then it says, he now is living with the result of that. And what's the result? He now feels like a failed father because he has nothing in his hand for his son. And the same way he came into the world with nothing, he is going to leave with nothing. And so the question that comes out of this story about this man who lost everything is what was it all for? All the anxiety, all the worry, all the sleepless nights, the juggling of the complexity, the the pursuit of money and possessions to satisfy cravings that were never satisfied, what was all for? And the answer is it was for nothing. Because his life now is full of darkness and frustration and anger and sickness. This is what he received because he believed money to be the means to happiness. And what he found was the exact opposite, that it was all vapor, vanity. You see, The reason that he experienced this is because just like us, when we pursue money and possessions as the means of satisfaction or happiness or success in our life, that's what we're going to find, that we believe that, we go on that quest. The reason that we find frustration anger or darkness and the reason that we perceive that in other people is because we have misunderstood the place and the purpose of money we've misunderstood the place and the purpose of money you see listen the problem is not money it's not the problem the problem is the premise of the quest The problem is not money. The problem is the premise of the quest. The premise was for this man, which is for many of us, that money is going to provide all that we need. It's going to satisfy the longings and cravings of our heart. It's going to give us a good life. It's going to fill us with joy. The object of the quest is wrong. It's a faulty premise to place money as the thing that you need more of. You will not find what you need. In fact, you will find quite the opposite. And this is exactly what the Koheleth shares in verse 18 through 20 as he shares a story of another person, which is to give us hope. It's the realization that he comes to, and this is the person that we are to be. Verse 18 through 20. He's, he says, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. You see, the picture here is of someone who is not living a life that is meaningless. This picture of this person has money and possessions and some sort of wealth and has work, but has placed money in its proper position understands the purpose of money. And and it kind of sounds when you read it on its face that he's saying what he said earlier, which is also a repeated theme in Ecclesiastes, that you're just to look upon the good of what is before you. 
Look upon the good of your work. Look upon the good of your possessions and the money you have and to enjoy your life now. And that certainly is a dominant theme in Ecclesiastes and in part is true here. But if that's what you think what he's saying is that the answer is just try to live simply to go get yourself an RV and to drive around and just be grateful. Just have gratitude in your heart. You're missing what he's saying here because there's a key word that is, that is present here in verse 18 through 20 that is not in the rest of the chapter. See if you can locate it. Let's read it again. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that, here's the key word, God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Do you see how this person has a different premise to the quest of life, a different object to run after? See, there's still money here. There's still wealth. There's still possessions. There's still work. There's still enjoyment in every day. But there is a, a, a placement of those things in the right location. And that is not the center of this person's heart. What is at the center of this person's heart is God. And so what this person is able to say in the way this person lives is, the days I have now are the days that God has given me. And the money and the wealth and the possessions and the job that I have now is a gift from God to me. And the thing that occupies my heart is not more money, it is more of God. It says God is the one that occupies his heart to bring joy. You see, the quest for a life of contentment and a life of joy is not more money, it's more God. Because when you have more of God, you have an openness to see the days before you, knowing that God is arranging them and that he is in, in, sovereign in control. So you can find peace and rest and not stay up sleepless nights anxious to maintain the machine because it's all on your shoulders. When you're pursuing more of God, you can look at the money and the possessions and the wealth that you have and the work that you find yourself in or the work that you're pursuing and you can say, this is all a gift of God. Therefore, I can enjoy it, but I need to be careful not to allow it to sit in the wrong seat in my life. Keep it in its proper place. You see, when you're pursuing more of God, what you find is verse 20, that God will occupy your heart with joy. Money will not occupy your heart with joy. That's a false premise. God will, because he is the one that is meant to occupy the place of prominence in your life. This is such a vital truth. It sounds simple, but it is so vital because it transforms the way you live and it protects you against the dangers of money. You know, you may have been to church before and heard the preacher say this, Jesus speaks about money more than he speaks about anything else. I want you to raise your hand if you've heard a preacher say that. And if you're alone, it's okay, just raise your hand. And if you're in your car and you raise your hand, the person looks next to you and thinks that you're crazy, it's okay, just raise your hand. I know I've heard this many, many times. Now, Jesus speaks a lot about money. In fact, out of the 39 parables, 11 of them are about money. Listen to this. One out of every seven verses where Jesus is speaking it's about money. Jesus speaks about money a lot. He says some striking things. Can't serve two masters. Already shared that. God and money. He also says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Wow. Speaks about money. The dangers of going on a quest for more money. Of allowing that to take the place of prominence in your heart. But there is a bigger issue that Jesus 
is actually using money to point us to, a more important matter. Because out of the 39 parables, 11 of them are about money, but 18 of them are about food. So, I mean, have you ever heard somebody say that Jesus is most concerned with food? No. But he uses food, just like he uses money, to reveal the important matter that he wants us to see, the quest that he wants us to go on, and that is a quest towards the kingdom of God. This is where Jesus' focus is, the kingdom of God. In fact, John the Baptist, who was called by God to prepare the way of Jesus the Messiah, he says, prepare yourself, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He wants to direct us to the kingdom of God because this, in fact, is the quest that we are to be on. Not a quest for more money, but a quest for more of God and a quest for more of his kingdom. Jesus told us to pray that his kingdom would come from heaven to earth. That we're called to be ambassadors of ushering in that kingdom. That the chief danger with money is that it will lead you away from the kingdom. It will lead you to run after the kingdoms of this world instead of pursuing and going on a quest towards the kingdom of God. You see, there is only one kingdom that has eternal value. That is the kingdom of God. The kingdoms of this world are temporary shelters. There is only one kingdom that has purpose that is lasting, that you're invited to participate in now. The other kingdoms want to use you for their purpose. There is only one kingdom that can nourish your, sh- your soul and can occupy your heart with joy, as verse 20 says in Ecclesiastes. And the kingdoms of this world will just hollow you out. They will hollow your soul out. You see, the preacher here in Ecclesiastes 5 at the very end tells about a man, and maybe this was him, who found what Jesus preaches And that is that money cannot nourish your soul. You know who else found that was Blaise Pascal, the mathematician and philosopher. He says this. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ Christ made known through Jesus Christ. See, the quest of your life should not be a quest for more money, but for more God. To pursue his kingdom and praise God that he opened up a way for you to become a citizen of his kingdom and to be involved in his kingdom that is at hand, and that is through Jesus Christ. See, Jesus invites you through faith To find yourself a kingdom citizen, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, not because you did anything right, not because you decided to walk the right path and embark on the right quest. In fact, no, you and me are people that go on the wrong quest time and time again. Tempted many of us by a quest for more money and more possessions. But yet the gospel that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Savior of the world, came and died and was buried and rose from the dead so that when you surrender to him in faith, when you believe that his death was for a payment of your sins, that his burial and his resurrection is victory for you so that your life is no longer vain, it is no longer fleeting, it is not vapor, in fact, it is eternal because of what Jesus has done for you. You find yourself a kingdom citizen. You see, all people that believe in Jesus are people of the kingdom. And that means that is the very thing that you are called to pursue. Not the kingdoms of this world that want to use you. The kingdom that you've been invited to participate in. The kingdom of God. Your quest is for more God. Your quest is for more God in your life more God in your marriage, more God in your kids, more God in your work, more God in your friendships, and listen to this, more God in your money. More God in your money because it is a gift from him to you. 
It is something for you to enjoy, but it is something for you to use for his kingdom because money is not neutral. You use it or it uses you. And you are called to use it for good, for the good of others and for the good of his kingdom. I said in our giving moment, Proverbs 11, listen to that verse again, verse 25. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You see, it's okay to enjoy the gifts that God has given you the money, the possessions, to enjoy your work. That's in fact good and right. But the, the, pre, the, the place of prominence in your heart, the quest that you are to be on is a quest for more of God in every sphere of your life. In as, every sphere that you touch, can you bring more of God? Which means that your wealth and your money is not only to be used so that you might enjoy it or your family might enjoy it. It is also for you to use to bring more of God into any place that you can. Because C.S. Lewis reminds us that the only things that we can keep are the very things that we offer to God, that we freely give to God. Would we be on that quest? A quest for more of God, not more money. A quest for more of God in every sphere of our life, finding that as we use all the gifts that we've been given, including our money, to refresh other people, we find our soul refreshed too. Because what ultimately nourishes our soul is Christ and his kingdom. Money and possessions will never satisfy. Will you pray with me? God, we pray for your truth to really go deep into our soul to challenge us, to reveal some of the faulty premises that we hold on to. Which may be a quest for more money, more possessions. Would we see that the quest that you've called us to go on as people of faith, as kingdom citizens, is in the direction of you. You are the object God, we want more of you in our life, in our marriages, in our friendships, in the communities that we inhabit, in our work. God, we want more of you in our money, how we see it, how we use it, how we enjoy it. Pray that you would encourage us with wisdom as we find in Proverbs that when we use our life and we live generously, to refresh others, we ourselves are refreshed. Because as we pursue you, God, you occupy our heart with joy, which is what we crave and long for more than anything. Well, we trust your word is true instead of the faulty claims of culture that want to lead us in the opposite direction of your kingdom to other kingdoms that want to use us for their gain. We want to pursue you, God, and be used by you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.